data is pretty much the worst variable name that you can <laughs> that you can uh, <laughs> name your variables. Though, what does this variable contain? It contains data. Sort of like if you were moving uh, houses and you just labeled all of your moving boxes as stuff. Hey everyone, it's David Bumble back with a very, very special guest. He's the author of this book, as well as a whole range of other books, and I'm really excited to have him. Al, welcome. Hello, thanks for having me. So this book is like really famous, and it's a fantastic book. Um, but this is not the only book you've written, and it's not your first book. Do you want to give us a bit of a history of like the, you know, how you got into, you know, writing this and, and the books that you perhaps wrote before this? Because it's quite a cool story. Yeah, so about, I think around 2008 or 2009, um, my girlfriend at the time was a nanny for this 10 year old who wanted to learn how to code. And I thought, yeah, sure. Okay, I can, I can find some tutorials online, but didn't really find anything that just sort of presented the source code to you know, some little video games or things like that. That's yep. sort of how I learned how to program was finding these, you know, like listings in the basic programming language of a guess the number game and that sort of thing. And a lot of things seem to either be just for computer science majors yep. or advanced experienced professionals, or they're more just sort of like, here's how computers work and here's a monitor and here's a keyboard and and that sort of low level <laughs> things uh, yeah. that y you don't really, that's uh, not too helpful. And so I thought, well, I don't know, I guess I could start writing up a tutorial. And that small tutorial kept growing and growing in size. And so I put it on a website and it started getting some traction. And uh, yeah. I decided to go the self-publishing route. And it's it's sort of amazing that once it was an item that you could buy off of Amazon, people started calling me an author, which I didn't really think of myself as at the time. I was just yet another software engineer. I had started writing up these materials and uh, people liked that book. Uh, that was Invent Your Own Computer Games with Python. And so I wrote a second book that became Making Games with Python and Pygame. I wrote a third book, uh, which later became Cracking Codes with Python. And so at this point, this was about 2014 or 2013, I approached No Starch Press with an idea about creating Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. And I had noticed that there's a lot of people out there who don't necessarily want to become software engineers, but yeah. they have an office job. They're dealing with Microsoft Excel all day. Uh, they have a lot of just mindless clicking and typing that they have to do. And, and they would tell me these stories. And I thought like, well, you know, if you knew a little bit about programming, you could then write your own script to automate this because it would be something very, very personal for their own workflow or, or how their organization is set up. So there's no commercial software to do this. And at the same time, it's such a small task. You don't want to hire a consultant to write this software for you. And it just became... Uh, oh, sorry to interrupt you. You've got a really cool story. You've got to tell us that story. Uh, I heard it on another podcast where someone used your book, I think it was, and then they had a very long lunch. Can you explain that? Oh, yes. So this is the story I, I have at the uh, in the intro of Automate. This is my roommate in college who was telling me this story about how he worked at this one retailer. About every year or every quarter, maybe, they would get just a huge printout, just a stack of paper about all the prices. I think it was either for their competitors or, or something. Somehow they had gotten this information. And one by one, they would have to look up a price on this big stack of paper, type it into their store database, and then they would just want to make sure that their store's price was at or under the price of their competitors. And this would take yeah. a team of three people like a couple days to do just to go through the entire thing. And so my roommate who was working there at the time saw them just, you know, in this conference room, just going through all this paper. And he said, well, you know, if you have the original data from that printout, I could write a script that could then just automatically do the database lookups uh, itself. And, you know, it took him about a couple hours to write this program. And then when he ran the program, it took about two seconds to, to run. And all of all of his friends uh, or, or all of his coworkers just said like, wow, you've just saved us two hours or two days of work. And so uh, I don't think they actually told their manager that they had finished early. They just <laughs> sort of took a very uh, extra long lunch at the end of that. <laughs> So the the main book that you've got is the cipher book on that's an ethical or hacking focus. Have you done anything else like not perhaps in a book, but have you like uh, any other examples and ideas that you can share or perhaps another book using Python to hack or something? Oh, um, yeah. So my personal history was I was like a teenage wannabe hacker. 
but I, I didn't have any information at all. And, and it, uh, I had some friends who were hackers, uh, but then you, looking back on it, I realized actually they didn't know anything. They, they just made up <laughs> most of their claims. I, I realized like, I was like, oh, what they were describing is actually impossible. And I think they just made it up. But I, I always had that interest in computer security. It's just that I, I sort of took the path into software development afterwards and then later uh, book writing. But yeah. uh, it is something that I was interested in. And so the closest thing that I, I, that I have is cracking codes with Python, which just goes into breaking those classic ciphers. And security is, is also just a very wide field. Encryption yeah. and cryptography is a small part of it. And then uh, if you want to go down that path, you'll have to learn a lot of mathematics as well. If you want to go into the creation of ciphers and, and cryptanalysis and that sort of thing. But um, you didn't go to jail. So is that right? What? You didn't get into trouble. Sorry, you didn't go to jail or get into trouble for hacking, did you? Uh, my lawyer has advised me not to answer that question. <laughs> I'm a really good lawyer. Um, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to go into that at all. Um, <laughs> I mean, this in the 90s, it was also just sort of hacking was also seen as more of a prank. I mean, infamously, yeah. the uh, the Morris worm, a uh, very early self-propagating program that uh, ended up crashing a lot of systems that was written by Robert Morris just as an experiment more than anything that just quickly got out of control. But these days, it's not as funny uh, and simple as a prank because we have, well, just computers are so much more relevant to our lives. And yeah. uh, we have uh, viruses that send out spam emails. Uh, we have crypto locker uh, programs. We have issues with stalking uh, and, and doxing people. And so the need for security is, is much more heightened. And again, a, a lot of these uh, scams uh, that work online, they're just so much more relevant to our lives. And so that, that is a very serious uh, topic. And I, I also have this written in Automate the Boring Stuff, because especially with uh, GUI automation, uh, if you can write a Python program that controls the mouse and keyboard, well, you can then use it to uh, just sign up for a million different free email accounts and then use yeah. those to uh, harass people. Or And I, I write up that, you know, it's a, a lot of the hacker folks that I know, uh, there is this tendency to think, well, as long as I'm being clever, I'm not doing something that's wrong. And, and it is this immaturity of not wanting to acknowledge that you can do harm and that you are doing yeah. harm. It's like, well, I hacked into my friend's email address, but they don't know I did. So it's it's fine. And it's like, oh, uh, that's uh, like, are, are you their friend if you're doing things like that? And, and it's really easy to get excited about this power and, and capability that, that you can do, uh, that you really do need to stop yourself and say like, oh, I don't know, is this ethical? I mean, is it yeah. even ethical to write a program that just refreshes the web page over and over again so that I can buy tickets and get ahead of everybody else in line? And these are questions where, you know, just because you can do something, does that mean you should do it? Yeah, I'll say, I'll say this on the channel, we, we are only advocate ethical hacking not uh, right yes. that stuff yeah because is, that yeah. uh people being knowledgeable about security uh, there's a great demand for that um yep. because of this and so we do need people who are security professionals who can keep our systems uh secure because not everybody has time to learn about uh, like oh well you should have used such and such uh encryption program because exactly. clearly yeah. uh, version two of this doesn't work and, blah, and like all this detailed knowledge that you know People have other things that they're that they're doing. Um, not everyone can become a security consultant. That's so great. I mean, sorry, I interrupted your flow. You were you were talk, telling us the the history of the books. Sorry. So automate the boring stuff. I I started writing that, and you know, because I had all these stories of yeah. of people, you know, who were who were not software engineers, who were not computer science majors, and they they kind of asked me like, well, I don't know what what would I need to know, and I thought, well, Python is great because. Yeah. Python it has such a gentle learning curve. Uh, I, I started looking at how people learn to program today, and I realized it is so much easier to program today. Uh, the expectations are really high because when we yeah. think of programming, we think of 
AI and self-driving cars and social media websites with millions of users. But actually, programming today is is way easier than it was in the 90s or 80s, just because the, the language is easier, the tools make it easier, there's so much more documentation and help. And uh, so I started compiling a list of, well, okay, what do non-software engineers need to learn? What What is the programming for office workers? Uh, yeah. What are those topics that they need to have? And so, you know, I came up with a list and that sort of became Automate the Boring Stuff with Python, which is a, a title that I remember throwing a whole bunch of words together and thinking like, well, it's needs to have Python in it, it needs to have automate yep. in it. And well, what am I showing people how to do? Because I didn't want to just have like, oh, programming for beginners in Python or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's a very boring, yeah. Yeah, and, and there's just so much boring stuff that you don't <laughs> exactly. want to do. And yep. this is why we have computers to make yep. our lives easier, even though oftentimes computers make our lives more difficult. But um, yeah, this this uh, all came together into this book. And I I remember I, I looked into my diary entry while I was writing this book and I had some day where I said like, I have no idea if this book is going to be popular at all. I've, I've spent like a year writing this. I, I left my job as a software engineer because I, I sort of wanted to switch companies at that point anyway. So I thought like, okay, yeah. I'll just take a year off, finish writing this book and then get another software developer job. And the book really took off. And so now I've been writing books pretty much ever since, uh, what, 2013. Before we get into the into more details about the book, what I, I really like about what you're doing amongst many things, you're not putting the books behind a paywall. Is that right? That's right. So all of my books are released under a Creative Commons license. So you can download them for free at inventwithpython.com. You can also make derivative works from it as long as you use it non-commercially and and also release that under a similar license. Yeah, you know, a lot of people are surprised that yeah. people will still buy a book that is freely available online and including me. I'm completely surprised that people do that. Well, look at my bookshelf. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people still do like actually having a, a nice printed book. But Definitely. more than that, I think it turned out to be a good business decision, uh, even though it wasn't really a decision at all. But because it was freely available online, people could actually find it and then read through it. And that generated the word of mouth uh, to, to make it really popular. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing. I I love it. Um, that's what I love about YouTube and other like platforms. And uh, I, we must, we, I want to mention your YouTube channel because I just looked at your subs. You're just under 100,000. So everyone who's watching, please go and subscribe. I'll put the channel below. Um, let's uh, let's show some love. Al, you're not just um, giving your books away for free, but you've also got videos, is that right? So it's on your YouTube channel and it's on other platforms, is that correct? That's right. So I created a course, uh, an online video course that follows Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. The book still has more information. Um, originally, I thought like, well, I could just create this course to help uh, promote the book, but a lot of people seem to really like the, uh, the online yeah. course as well. Uh, every month, at the beginning of each month, I, I really release free coupon codes uh, to get free signups. Uh, as many as Udemy will allow me to, to put out there. Yeah, so the course is on Udemy, yeah? Yes, Sorry. yeah. So I have the, the first 15 videos of the 50 video course on my YouTube channel. Um, and then you can also check out uh, Udemy as, as well for the full course. It covers all the, the same concepts that I, that I have in the book, but I figured that a lot of people would much rather just actually see somebody typing yep. the actual code into it. There's there's this huge disconnect that some people find hard to to read code in the page and think, okay, I'm going to put this into my computer and then it yep. will work. But then people are sort of intimidated of, am I doing this right? I have no idea. Uh, but seeing somebody else type it into idle uh, or, or the interactive shell really sort of I don't know, makes it just that much more real of like, oh, this is a person doing this. I can do this. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, and uh, I think last late last year is when I passed one million uh, uh, registrations on the online course. Thank you. That's a huge. It's a huge accomplishment, and uh, it speaks volumes to the fact that I think if you give away a lot, like you said, it, it it was a business decision to give away stuff. It hasn't affected you, and in some ways, it's helped you. Is that right? Yes, um, it's. I I really recommend that more people do this. Uh, it's. 
Well, I, it's actually really hard. I, I tell people, ignore all the advice I give about writing books or creating <laughs> online courses, because it's sort of like asking a lottery winner what numbers they picked. All of this seemed to work out for me, and uh, I'm not really sure uh, how much of that is luck and how much of that is hard work. Of course, it's both, but I some days I tend to think that, well, I got pretty lucky with getting my, you know, putting my work out there and having it get noticed. And uh, it's... It's definitely been a very wild ride. I, I really thought that I would be a software engineer at some generic Silicon Valley tech company that, uh, here in 2022. I really could not have predicted all of this. I mean, you're very humble. I mean, and that, that's what's also amazing. It's, and it's fantastic because, I mean, this book wouldn't have done well if it didn't get good reviews. And the reviews on Amazon are amazing. Um, yeah. So I've, kudos to you. Sorry, go I've always thought that the, the secret to that was that I really strive to try to remember what it's like to be a beginner. Yeah. And and I have huge blind spots about that as well. But I think there's just a lot of software nerds who have learned yep. so many cool techniques and so many, so many like awesome tools and, and other sophisticated things. And it's, it's really exciting to have all that knowledge. And then when you try to teach it to other people, you immediately want to just plunge them into the deep end, yep. which exactly. is utterly terrifying for a lot of people. I find that actually teaching children how to program is much easier than teaching adults because children don't think of programming as this something that you have to be really smart or super genius to understand. And clearly with the amount of mistakes that I make, even after over 20 years of experience writing software, um, I'm still forgetting semicolons and, and getting like small syntax errors and wondering why my program doesn't work. And then three hours later, I realize, oh, because I <laughs> wrote the code incorrectly and that's it's doing exactly what I'm telling it to do. I mean, it's great to hear that from someone like you. And I think it's an encouragement for everyone who's starting out. Um, so let's talk about what I think you've called it gateway drugs into programming. There's specific topics that you that you sort of hone in on. So let's talk about those. Yeah. So the way that I got into programming was that my parents uh, bought my sister and I an 8-bit Nintendo. Uh, this is very much dating myself. But uh, <laughs> I, so I really loved Mario and Zelda. And, and I thought like, oh, that'd be, that'd be really cool. And, and I was very fortunate that my family had a PC in the house growing up. You know, this is, of course, lots of programmers love telling you this story. It's like, oh, I had a Commodore 64 and it only had two kilobytes of memory and whatever. I had to yeah. use a magnetized needle to set the hard drive platters to everything. <laughs> you know, all of those stories. Anyway, yes, I've had, I had a computer um, and I found a book in the library uh, that, went into programming small games in basic and i thought like okay this is kind of cool and i read through it and i didn't really understand most of it but i could copy the source code and then start making little changes yeah and um i really hate telling this story of how i learned to program because i knew i knew you, I, I, i've got on my question yeah I know you hate this question, but how old were you when you started to code? So I'm oh, sorry yeah, to put you yeah. on that spot, but go on. Oh, I think maybe like in the third grade or so, you know, about like seven or eight years old. And that's when I started, like started to program. I'm doing air quotes a lot in this interview because uh, there's, there's so many things that are not straightforward about my path uh, in, into programming. And, and I feel that a lot of people are really intimidated because they hear stories like mine and think like, well, okay, I, I didn't learn to program as a kid and I, I didn't have a computer in the house when I was growing up. And, oh God, I'm so old. I'm already 23. Is it too late for me to become a software <laughs> yeah. developer? And I hear that a lot, yeah. Yeah, I'm 23. You don't know how old I am. That's right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and... And so the one thing that I that I want to make clear to people, and I have this in the in the introduction of automate the boring stuff to Py with Python, is that basically everything that I learned about programming from elementary school to uh, graduating high school, anyone could learn that in I don't know maybe a couple dozen weekends. It yeah. it wasn't that much. It was mostly that I had a lot of time to just mess around with, with little programs. I wasn't really thinking of it as I need to create a career uh, and, and build up. And there's all these different frameworks that I need to learn. And I need to learn every programming language out there. Uh, I really wanted to create, you know, just Zelda. And also, by the time I graduated high school, I was not programming Zelda. I, I never even uh, 
got like that Tetris program working exactly right. But mostly it was just playing around with with really small programs. And uh, yeah. I, I took this idea and I put it into my book, the big book of small Python projects, which are all text-based programs, which I feel like is very 1980s and, and might not capture people's imaginations. But the real benefit of that is that because the source code is in text and the yeah. program output is in text, it's a lot easier to see the cause and effect behavior between those two. And uh, I, I just want to assure people that, you know, you don't have to be a genius. Um, certainly I and my coworkers, uh, when I was working at a tech company, uh, we made lots of uh, learning experiences, let's call them. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yeah. And and I had the benefit of of then knowing what I wanted to do. So I, I went to the University of Texas at Austin for a computer science degree. A lot of it was was good timing. After graduating, I moved to San Francisco and, and got a job there. And this was sort of before the, the housing prices really skyrocketed. And so I was able to get experience there. And, and I've just had a lot of opportunities and privileges. And I thought like, well, this is something that I want to make available to everyone because Everyone should have the benefits of generational wealth, uh, growing up in a, in a household that have that has a computer there. I remember I would go down to the Barnes and Nobles after school uh, a lot and then just sort of pull these, you know, sixty dollar, eighty dollar uh, books on programming or, or computing and just sort of I treated Barnes and Nobles as my uh, <laughs> personal library sort of. I love it. Yeah, it got so bad. This was in the 90s before cell phones. It got so bad that my friends would often call Barnes and Noble. Oh, wow. And, uh, and then so they would go on the PA and it's like, would customer Albert Swigert please come to the front desk of a phone call? Which thinking back on it, wow, those employees must have had a lot of patience for this random teenager who's showing up day after day. Yeah, so so a lot of these little stories of, of how things worked out. And, and I remember... You can you can often find times find a deal on Udemy to uh, just sign up for the course for eighteen dollars or twenty dollars, uh, especially yeah. if you open the uh, website in privacy mode when the website <laughs> thinks you're a brand new customer and they'll offer you the deal that way. I love it, but but I still I still remember being a teenager where you know eighteen and eighteen dollars twenty dollars that's still a lot of money for me. It um, it's something that I feel like I've, I've gotten a little too used to having that Silicon Valley tech's uh, salary kind of level of money, but also at the same time thinking, well, you know, this is a barrier to access to a lot yeah. of people, both outside the United States, but also within the United States as, as well. And so how are, how are the, what are the things that I could do to, to get rid of most of these uh, barriers? And, Putting the book online for free uh, seems to be really great. Huge. Yeah, I mean, computers are just absolutely amazing devices, um, even though they're just all around us all the time. We've gotten used to them, but it, it helps to stop and think like, you know, it costs me about $15 a month to have this web host. And then I can just, you know, it took a lot of work to write the book. But once it's written, I can just put it on this website and tens of thousands of people can download it. And, and I pay like 15 bucks for that. And so it's, it's incredible what you can do uh, with computers. And especially when you know, just a little bit of programming. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's fantastic. I mean, it's, uh, I love that. And that's sort of like my mission on my channel and the stuff that I do, like you try and give away as much as I can. And what I find amazing in, in sort of the community that I'm in is a lot of people who can afford it will support me uh, to allow more and more people who can't afford it to get it for free. So I think we all win. It's 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 amazing, and I, I I love it that you you know are making all this knowledge available for free. And these days, what are the requirements, for instance, to take your to to go through the book? You just need a computer, some type of computer. Is that right? That's right. And uh, uh, these days, that's becoming even more and more accessible. Uh, even if it all is. you have is just a tablet or or your smartphone, uh, there is also online interactive shells in Python and, and all these online tools. Uh, I was at PyCon uh, earlier uh, this year, and the, the big news from there was uh, just running Python in the browser, just getting the That's actual amazing. C Python yep. code 
uh, running in the browser. And they they stress like this is still very early alpha release software, but uh, everybody's just really excited. It's so amazing that people are just it's like, huge, oh, you can now run Python thing, yeah. in, in the browser and it's great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's so true because I, I'll say this, a lot of the audience who watch are in India and other places. And I've had people say, David, how do I study? Because all I've got is my cell phone. And I mean, it's a huge development that you, you, you know, you can code in, in a browser. I just, you know, go to some of these sites and um, spin up a, a server or just directly in the browser and learn. So the barriers to entry are so much lower. It, it's fantastic that you're doing this. When we spoke about like the gateway drug into into coding, I think it was games. Is that is that what, that's what got you hooked? Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So I, I feel like a lot of people followed that path of, hey, yeah. I'm really interested in video games and yeah. uh, I'd like to create my own video games, even though, especially these days, you can have, uh, I, I teach kids from time to time and they'll sort of have inflated expectations of like, hey, let's make <laughs> Minecraft. And it's like, it's well, like we only have an hour and a half. So, yeah. uh, hmm. yeah. but uh, at the same time, it is, it is sort of a very common gateway uh, to learning how to program. But there's, I also, I also want to acknowledge it's not the only way um, yeah. because, you know, in fact, not every child or every adult is into interested in, in video games. There's also a lot that you can do with music and art uh, and using programming and using programming there, or just uh, you, you have a very tedious office job and you, and you want to uh, uh, automate a lot of those boring tasks that you have. And uh, it's it's really amazing that in the last you know twenty years or especially ten years, I feel that you know the '90s were sort of when PCs were getting more and more into homes, and then the 2000s is sort of when everyone was getting online and on the internet, and then uh, in the 2010s is really when everybody's on social media, and now we also have smartphones in our pockets. And so you know if if you were just somebody who chatted online with your friends every day. 25 years ago, you were a huge dork. But yeah. today, you're just the average Facebook user. Yeah, I mean, that's what I love about your books, because you've got coding with Minecraft. So if someone, that's aimed for at, at, at kids, is that right? Or was that just general, like uh, code it, games and stuff? <laughs> it is aimed at kids. I have the strong suspicion that there are a lot of adult Minecraft players <laughs> out there. It's a play that keeps it for gaming we Starting off with the ultimate game of all time, Minecraft. That's right possibly myself included in that. Um, yeah, Coding with Minecraft covers a mod called Computercraft, which adds these programmable robots into the into the game world. So you can craft these robots and then you can write code in the Lua scripting language. The robots themselves are called turtles because they're very much like the old logo uh, line drawing turtles where you can tell them to you know move forward, turn left, move yep. forward, uh, start mining things, start crafting things. All the, it, um, I joked earlier uh, with the publisher, it's like, well, how about we call this automate the Minecraft stuff um, for the uh, book <laughs> title? And then we decided to pass on that. But um, yeah, it, it was sort of uh, like how it's like, you know, mining stuff in Minecraft is actually getting pretty boring. Uh, how can I automate this with some robot? But I love it because I mean, I think the, what you've done, which is great, is you've got a whole range of books, and some of them are like um, like you've got Scratch programming, um, you've got coding uh, with Minecraft, but you so that covers like perhaps like for my I, I, know, I know what you're saying earlier about kids. You you mustn't expect that you have to start coding when you're young, but I think when you're when you, you when you're a parent, you also have the other problem where you think, okay, how do I get them interested in coding? How from a young age, I'd like them to learn this stuff because it's a skill that can change your life. And I mean, that's a fantastic way to get in. So get them in through the games like you got in. But then like for other people who do, are not into games, you've got this, like, I think you, you mentioned like the way to program is gaming, Excel, and then hacking. Those are like three things that you kind of cover, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, my other book, Cracking Codes with Python, uh, goes into how to break very simple ciphers. These are sort of the classical ciphers that yeah. people used up until World War II, once we started having computers be able to do uh, code breaking for us. But uh, these are all sort of simple substitution ciphers and the visioneer cipher and and transposition ciphers and all these other my, uh, things that, you know, I would I used to have these books that were sort of like spy craft for kids and how to use yeah. lemon juice to make invisible ink and, and that sort of thing. And they would always have some sort of decoder ring section yes. in those. And, and you can still find a lot of these books today, 
But I thought, well, it'd be really great to learn how to program and write books that can that can do these ciphers and then also write programs that can break these ciphers. So if you don't have the encryption key, you just have the cipher text. Um, how can you use computers to analyze that and then uh, recover the original plain text from that? Um, and then at the very end, I go into the RSA algorithm. I, I, I love the story at the beginning. Sorry, go on. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I warn readers to, to you know, not actually use any of the uh, encryption programs that they that they write in this book, because uh, clearly, you know, for real world encryption, they, they are very much not sufficient for safeguarding your data. I think a lot of people do get a kick out of yeah. just watching their computers start crunching a bunch of numbers and then spitting out the answer. There's this trend in networking in the last few years, which is like, you as a network engineer need to learn Python so that you can automate your network. When I was studying like a Python course, at, I don't want to mention the name, some university here in the UK, I found it really extremely boring because they were doing like math rather than like, I, I've got this problem, I want to solve it, but now you're teaching me some other arbitrary stuff. And I think what you've done great here is you've, you've taken like different reasons to learn this. You're giving people a reason very, very quickly, like, if you do this, you you can automate some Excel task or some task that saves you time. So you're not learning coding for the sake of coding. You're learning coding to accomplish something. Right. I mean, if you do want to become a software engineer, automate the boring stuff with Python is a great introduction to, yeah. to that career path, but it is by no means comprehensive. I skip a, a lot of minor topics where I feel like, well, you don't actually need to know this. So, you know, list comprehensions or object-oriented programming yeah. and, and classes, I completely skipped that because I, I just wanted to go from zero to productive in as little time as possible. I, I also remember a lot of my computer science uh, education, and I'm glad I have that CS degree, yeah. and I, I did learn things in it. But at the same time, I don't view it as strictly necessary to to go through a four year program to be able to to be productive or even to get a job. Um, certainly, having that piece of paper does help you get your foot in the door for those jobs. But uh, I, I feel like we tend to teach programming and computer science in the same way that we learn it. And so, yeah, you'll find that a lot of computer science sort of grew out of mathematics uh, yeah. in. Uh, from universities. And I have a whole rant about how much I don't like pseudocode, uh, especially pseudocode that uses uh, Greek letters for variable names, because, well, you can't actually type Greek letters on a standard keyboard. And uh, the pseudocode isn't something that you can run under a debugger. And it really helps to make the, the code examples for some algorithm fit on a single PowerPoint slide. Yeah. But, you know, this uh, math notation is really terse and cryptic and, and looks downright something occultic, <laughs> um, maybe. But that's because, you know, people were writing it on chalkboards or on paper, and you don't want to spend a lot of time writing out uh, long variable names. So uh, I feel like, you know, with, with a lot of uh, programming, you know, we just got used to calling our variable names X or Y, even though yep. we're not writing on chalkboards anymore, we're typing on a keyboard, we can write out much more descriptive variable names, but it's a very uh, hard habit to break. This was something that I thought about a lot in my upcoming book, um, The Recursive Book of Recursion. I saw that. Yeah. When's that out? Uh, so that should be coming out uh, in August. So uh, oh, great. Yeah. And uh, you can go to nostarchpress.com, uh, nostarch.com, uh, the uh, the publisher's website, and then get the ebook version of it immediately. Um, they're really nice because when you order the uh, or pre-order the print book, they also give you uh, a DRM free version of the ebook as well so that you can just load it on your own devices or read it on your laptop. But recursion is one of those topics that is just famously difficult to understand. And, and so I started looking at it and I thought, well, I think the, a lot of CS professors and instructors are just sort of bad at teaching it because they're teaching it the way that they learned it. And, and we've never thought about like, well, what are the things that make this uh, more confusing than it has to be. So I found out with recursion, it's uh, telling people what the call stack is, uh, was a major thing that was previously not explicitly explained to a lot of people. And uh, that's really why recursion is is so much more confusing uh, than it is. I often find that I, I do a lot of teaching and it's I always call it the curse of knowledge. 
If you yes. know too much, you're actually your own worst enemy when you try and teach someone who's brand new. Because like you just said there, you know, if you've, d- if you've done a four-year computer science degree, this kind of stuff looks easy, perhaps. But if, you, if you've never coded in your life, it's scary and stuff like that can put you off. And that's what I love about what you've done in the book. You've really taken it down to make it as simple as possible. And you give good, simple code examples that someone can, you know, immediately see the result of. <laughs> yeah, I, I just over and over again, I think it's a matter of just asking yourself, can you make this simpler? Can you make this yeah. simpler? Just really letting your perfectionism run away from you. And then the editor will tell you, uh, we actually need those chapters <laughs> somewhat sooner. To, and so they'll, they'll keep me more grounded. But I, I feel like even with Automate the Boring Stuff, uh, I'm really proud that of the code examples I give in the book, I think those are simple. But then at the end of each chapter, I have these practice projects where I say, okay, now take what you've learned in this book so far and write a program that simply does blah, 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 blah. And a lot of people will email me and said like, yeah, I don't really know how to do that. And then I realized like, oh, I, I just really was asking for far too much. So it's it's a note for the, uh, the third edition that I, I really need to have more uh, practice exercises that are simpler rather than just a few kind of complicated ones. Um, but yeah, the, the more, you know, the easier it is to forget how hard it was when you were first starting out. And, and I think that, uh, turns off a lot of people from programming because uh, certainly there's what computers are capable of and what computers are not capable of is really mysterious because on the one hand, you know, we can, we can create all this you know, amazing special effects for movies, uh, say, and that it looks incredible. But then also uh, it's, you know, there are also some snake oil companies out there who are saying like, yeah, we use machine learning to take a a picture of your face and we can predict the day you'll die or or something like that. Recently, I was I was telling uh, uh, making a post on social media that it's really important to deflate the sensational claims that a lot of very clickbait uh, or click hungry uh, websites will, will report about technology because, you know, telling people, um, yeah, Hey, we can put microchips in our pets and that will help find them if, if they're lost, because we can scan that that's realistic. But then saying uh, the COVID vaccine will put microchips in your bloodstream, that is not realistic. And being able to tell the difference between those two things uh, can be really hard if you don't know that much about the capability of technology and and software. And especially because you have a lot of uh, outlets that really want to hit you with a with a very compelling and frightening story saying like, oh, yeah, cars can now drive themselves, but can they also kill you? And your microwave will will develop sentience and then try to poison your family or, or something like that. It's uh, it's it's really hard if you're not uh, really aware of what programming actually is to to separate the the bogus claims from the more grounded ones. That's a good point. I mean, I wanted to get back to the book. You've got um. I've got version one here, or edition one. You've got a sec. The second edition is current, and your third edition is coming out soon. Is that right? Oh uh, no, the third edition is is still just uh, a lot of ideas uh, okay. that that I'm I'm planning to work on. It is sort of something that I do want to eventually come out with. There's a, a lot of people have been telling me like, oh well, I'd like to do um, OCR to do text recognition. Yeah, I'd I'd like to cover uh, uh, text to speech and add that as a a feature. And, and mostly I just have a lot of small details and it's really hard because I believe the book is over 500 pages at this yeah. point. The second edition added yeah. about another yeah, hundred added pages lot, or so. Yeah. 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 And, and I, I just don't want it to have this big intimidating uh, dictionary sized uh, book that just slams down on people's desks. Um, are dictionaries even, uh, is that a thing that people buy anymore? <laughs> I don't think I've my, actually my used kids, My kids don't know what that is. <laughs> exactly. It's like Google. Um, so I, I saw a presentation where you spoke about like the most popular parts of the book because you were getting like hits on your website. So could you tell us like what, what are the most popular parts and then let's go to 
I think the, the the least popular part. So, and I'll take a stab at that. But let's let's start with the two most popular, or what, maybe they're more. What are the most popular parts of the book? Oh, okay. So just from looking at the uh, the website traffic, I can tell that a lot of people are into web scraping and yeah. then also GUI automation. And so in the book, I cover using uh, Selenium uh, as a way to automate. Uh, and automatically control your browser. So using Selenium, uh, I remember when I first heard about it, I thought it was this big complicated uh, tool that the QA department uses to automate their tests. And actually you can start uh, controlling your web browser with just um, four or five lines of code, actually. It's brilliant, um, yeah. it's, it's great. Your Python script can then open up a browser and then automate clicking on things or filling out forms or finding links. And so much of what we do today on your computer is really what you're doing on your browser. Um, yeah. uh, you're, you're just interacting with all these public systems. And so being able to write a program that can say automatically refresh the, the page and check for any updates on a website and then notify you when, when you get an update that you're uh, looking for. That's really helpful. Uh, if you just need to pull off uh, a ton of data off of a web page and then simulate a click to the next link and then pull off all the data on the next page and just do that a thousand times over, you can write a script to do that. Uh, there's a lot of things where you want to write scripts uh, that sort of glue software systems together. Yeah. Um, you're not trying to create your own web browser. You have a web browser. You just need to uh, take all the data off this web page and then automatically put it into this Excel spreadsheet. Uh, you, so you just want to uh, combine those and integrate those two software systems. Normally, you would have to do this as a person just by you know selecting all, copying, pasting, and then doing that over and over again. And writing a script will, even, even if it takes you just as long to write the script to automate this system as it would be to do it by hand, I feel like programming uh, is psychologically so much more comfortable. I'd much rather be spending two hours writing code to do something in one second than spending two hours uh, doing that task manually. Uh, myself, but you got the code for next time. You can edit it and change. Yeah, it. yeah, and that's something that I always point out to people is you know even if it takes you longer to write the code to automate the, a task than it would be to do it yourself, you know that's two or three hours of practice you're getting uh, writing yeah. programming, and you will get better and better at it, and and be able to uh, write these little scripts faster too. And so the second part, uh, I think the second most popular part on of the automate the boring stuff with Python content is GUI automation. And this is essentially having a Python script that can automatically click and, and type on the keyboard for you. And this is a great way to sort of integrate your scripts and automate tasks with existing desktop software. For the browser, you definitely want to use Selenium or, or some other web scraping module, but for, you know, just a generic, desktop application. It could be literally anything. There's uh, probably not, there probably aren't any tools that can help you automate this uh, uh, tool yourself. But if you can then just set it up and then write a simple Python script to say, okay, click here, click here, check all these checkboxes, highlight the text in this text field, and then copy and paste it uh, into some other place. That's a really uh, amazing feeling especially once you finally get it all working correctly and you can just watch uh, on your computer, just hands-free, the mouse cursor is moving around automatically and so precisely. It gives me that amazing feeling like when you see just an assembly line with robotic arms just automatically and perfectly uh, performing all these steps over and over again. Um, and then occasionally your program will start clicking on the wrong thing because the window is actually <laughs> five pixels over than where you expected it to be. And then you have to stop it. Um, I, I use the metaphor of that scene in the movie Fantasia where uh, Mickey Mouse the, as the sorcerer enchants the brooms to fill the tub full of water, but then they keep filling it. And then eventually the water overfills and it's like, oh, this is automation gone mad. I, I had to put a, uh, a new feature into the GUI automation module for Python that I created, uh, Pi Auto you, GUI. You wrote, you wrote it, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I, I wrote that. Um, I was looking around on PyPI, the Python package index, where you can uh, download and install a lot of third-party modules. There were a lot of modules that 
worked on Mac, but not on Windows or vice yeah. versa, or they only worked on Python 3 and not Python 2. And so I thought, okay, well, I want to have a, a module that works on all platforms and also just has a very dead simple API. So you can just say import PyAutoGUI, PyAutoGUI.click, and then specify some X, Y coordinates. Just really simple. You don't have to do any sort of setup or init or, or you know, create your own framework for, for something. You will be amazed at how popular something can be if you just make it easy to use. Exactly. I, I feel like exactly. a lot of software engineers sort of forget that. Um, yeah. We love creating these hierarchies of classes and it's like, oh, the foo class inherits from the bar class and everything. And then the documentation, if we bother Crazy. to even write yeah. it, exactly, <laughs> it's just yeah. this exactly. giant ref wall of text. Um, and people are like, uh, how do I actually do things with this. <laughs> exactly. And sorry, I interrupted you. You were talking about the bath overflowing and then you had to do so, something. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, so I had to add a, a feature to PyAuto GUI where um, it just has a 10th second delay after each function you pass it. Um, because uh, So that way you can then slam the mouse cursor into one of the corners of the monitor and it will detect, okay, if the mouse cursor is in the corner, then just shut down because... The, the really great thing about GUI automation is that you can watch the, the mouse cursor start clicking around. But if your program gets out of control, uh, you can't move the mouse to close the program itself. Exactly. Uh, so you needed just some way of, of being able to shut down without, you know, pulling the plug on your computer. Yeah, I mean, it's it. I mean, those are just two fantastic examples of how you can use Python, which is a simple language compared to others. Um, um, and maybe, maybe we should talk about that. But before that, I was going to say, I, I, I suspect based on a presentation I saw you give that the least popular part perhaps of the book is regular expressions. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes and no. Um, I mean, people do. I say it in jest because people, like, people don't like it. Yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, it's uh, regular expressions are important, but it is one of those things that can be confusing and kind of intimidating and yeah. you don't necessarily have to know it. And so people, it's it's a very popular thing to put off learning about. Um, so just for people who don't know, regular expressions are sort of a miniature language for doing pattern uh, text pattern recognition. So, you know, if you're looking for a, a particular phone number uh, in you know web page, you can just hit Control F and then type that phone number in. But if you're just looking for any phone number, really you're looking for the pattern of text. And so here in America, that will be uh, three digits for the area code, and then a dash, and then followed by three digits, and a dash, and followed by four digits. And so a regular expression for that, uh, you can then uh, create a a regex uh, as it's called for that pattern, and then you can just feed it. You know, some giant uh, text file or something like that, and you can find every instance of a phone number in that tech in that uh, text document. And this is an incredibly useful thing. Uh, I I have an example of the code that you would have to write if you want to do this recognition yourself, compared to uh, just using a, a regex uh, module such as Python's RE module. But then again, you know, it's it's something that eventually every programmer will have a need for it, yeah, you but you're it. probably so not going to need it this week. Um, and it is kind of confusing. <laughs> so yeah, people people will just keep putting it off uh, as, as often as possible. But it is, it's sort of like using a debugger where yeah. it's like, oh, this is going to make your life so much easier. You just have to sit down and learn it. But it's like, no, no, I, I prefer just typing print and putting variables uh, uh, in there, and um, but it, it, it it's something that I definitely recommend everybody learn at some point. And would you recommend Python as the first language, or and, and what's your opinion about like other languages like C or Java stuff like that? Oh wait, there are other languages besides Python. <laughs> I like it. A good answer. Uh, oh, I like it. I mean, it's. Well I remember done. as as like a, a high school and, and college student, I, I kept learning all these different new languages, and sort of at the end of college uh, in the mid two thousands, I, I discovered Python, and I realized I haven't really learned any new programming languages since then. Um, I definitely recommend Python as the first programming language that you learn. It does not force you to learn a bunch of complicated concepts to do simple things. Uh, that's a big problem with, I feel, uh, Java, where even to create a Hello World program, you still have to type 
public static void main string args bracket bracket, which I will have burned into my brain and until the end of my days. But yeah, with, with Python, you know, hello world is just print hello world. And uh, I, I believe there's the saying, Python makes simple things easy and complicated things possible. Uh, it's, yeah. it's really a language that doesn't get in your way. And uh, because, you know, when you're first learning how to program, you're grappling with all of these programming concepts. And that's hard enough uh, as it is. You also don't want to have to learn all these tiny little uh, details that the language forces you to learn. I recommend Python as the first programming language to learn, hands down. Um, other people yeah, will say like, well, okay, JavaScript is useful and everything like that. And I feel, and I sort of agree with that, but at the same time, you know, that you can learn that later. It's it's also great to learn a second programming language just so that you can see how two different programming languages compare. It's it's sort of like traveling to a, a different country yeah. just to see how things are different there. And, and you learn things about your own country that you just sort of took for granted and thought was normal everywhere. So uh, learning a second programming language is, gives you that perspective. But Python, I, I always recommend as uh, the, the first language that somebody should learn. I love what you did here because it's quick wins. I mean, you know, if you're starting something new and I think that's a problem with Java and all these languages. You've got this massive mountain to climb before you see a result. But with a few lines of Python code, like right in the beginning of your book, you already see a result. Yeah, and, and that's something that I really like about the Scratch programming environment. Uh, can you talk about Scratch just for people who don't know what that is? Oh, so Scratch is a... Uh, it's a website you can go to uh, scratch.mit.edu. It's uh, from the uh, Lifelong Kindergarten uh, group at MIT. It's a wonderful programming environment for kids. Um, it, it really has this immediate feedback where you take these code blocks that you can snap together and you can create little games or animations. Uh, and then easily, just with a click of a button on the page, you can then share it with other people as well. And you can also go onto the site itself and find other people's games and look at the source code for, for their programs as well. I think they made a lot of very smart decisions. Uh, for example, yeah. the, the code blocks, I'm sure you've seen tons of software pieces like this where instead of typing out the source code, you just use the mouse to drag them together and snap them together. And uh, a lot of uh, places have also copied this from Scratch. Scratch was essentially doing it to... Uh, was the first to do it. And one thing that I realized is, well, if you have these code blocks that you can fit together, they only fit together in certain ways. And so it's actually impossible to make a syntax error in Scratch. That's very clever, yeah. Yeah, they, they also don't have any error messages. They've uh, sort of designed the language in such a way where if you're doing something weird, it'll have some, some very straightforward default behavior. And I can't tell you uh, how frustrating it is for kids who already might not have the best typing skills, so they're just sort of hunting and pecking to yeah. type out this code, and then they get some inscrutable error message because they forgot a comma somewhere, or they added too many commas, or, or something like that. And, and the error message doesn't say, you forgot a comma here. The, the error message yeah. will just say, like, uh, end of line string termination not found, or something like that. <laughs> um, so Scratch is, is a really great tool uh, to get kids uh, into programming because it's it has that immediate feedback. You you can spend about five minutes snapping some blocks together, and then you have you know a little program that's not great, but it is entertaining for a couple minutes at least, and it really builds uh, that it's confidence. For yeah, exactly, it's quick wins. Yeah, I love it. I mean, our Scratch is great. And so you would would you recommend Scratch for what age group, or would you say straight into Python, or does it just depend on the individual? So I, I used to teach a Saturday morning uh, programming class for kids, and I feel that uh, the official Scratch age range is from 8 to 16, but I found that older kids sort of start feeling like it's too kidsy and cutesy. Yeah. I mean, Scratch does a great job of not dumbing down any concepts. So you are uh, programming. Um, but the presentation is is a bit kidsy. And so I find that 8 to 12 is about a good age range, usually around 13 or, or 14. Um, kids sort of want to move on to a, you know, a real Python uh, or a real programming language like, like Python. But at the same time, you know, I still use Scratch whenever I have like, oh, I have like a little idea for an animation uh, say, and I just want to throw, I want to rapidly prototype something together. Scratch is actually a great tool for that. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but really 
if if you have an eight year old and they say like, hey, I want to I want to become a cool super hacker and learn how to program and they're excited and interested in it, you can just start them off with Python immediately. I feel like as long as as the kid has interest uh, that's there, Python is is certainly easier that to use than basic was for me when I was that age. Um, yeah. So so if anything, it's it's more appropriate. And then also uh, the scratch people also have scratch junior which is a, a tablet and smartphone app. Uh, and that's uh, even simpler than Scratch. I don't have a lot of experience teaching uh, kids with it. I've just played around with it. And that's for the uh, five to eight age range. And really, I think the only programming construct they have is sort of sort of direct movements and then loops. Um, I'm not even sure if they have like if else branching or anything like that, but they, they intentionally make it very simple. Uh, so, so certainly <laughs> nothing makes me feel old than watching toddlers expertly use iPads. Exactly. Yep. Out of the feeling. There's yeah. a lot of uh, quality tools out there and, and Scratch and Scratch Junior are also completely free to use. I mean, I think uh, just looking at the books again, if I was an adult now and um, I wanted to learn Python, which of your books would you recommend as a start? Is it the Automate the Boring Stuff or is there another book that you would, th you would yeah. recommend or does it just depend on interest? Sorry, go on. Yeah, I, I would definitely go uh, for Automate the Boring Stuff just as a general programming guide. Um, if you were into making little games, um, then invent your own computer games with Python uh, is also for complete beginners with no programming experience. And then if you do sort of find the idea of making these little code breaking programs uh, to be interesting, uh, cracking codes with Python is is also made for people with no previous programming experience. I'm glad you said that because I was going to ask you, do you need any experience at all? And it, so it's just different paths, is that right? Like different interests and then get your, the, the book takes that interest and then builds your Python knowledge. Yeah, and I feel that's a big part of my job, especially today, uh, yeah. creating Python materials uh, for beginners is just figuring out what interests people and then yeah. finding that as an angle to get them into programming because there are so many beginner program, like learn to code resources and, and things. And uh, some of them are uh, very well done. And then others are just clearly they're copying and pasting things from Wikipedia just because they want to make some quick bucks from, from this whole everyone needs to learn to code sort of uh, idea that's out there. So um, yeah, ciphers is one, video games is one, automating Excel spreadsheets is, is another idea. And then the Minecraft or Scratch. I, you know, I joke about this, but it is actually true. I sometimes do forget all the books that I've written. Uh, no, that's it's fine. fine. I mean, I, I was going to ask you, like, let's have done the basics now. Then you've got beyond the basic stuff with Python. Does that like introduce object oriented programming? Does it introduce other more advanced topics? Or is that like the next yeah. book to get? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people uh, kept asking me like, okay, I've read Automate the Boring Stuff or or they've read some other beginner uh, Python book like Python Crash Course or or um, some Udemy course, but they still feel like they're not writing code the way that be, that uh, expert uh, experienced software developers write code. And yeah. so I thought like, okay, well, I need to write a book that is for them. And so a lot of it is, is sort of the same kind of material that the book Clean Code uh, covers, but also at this point, Clean Code, I believe came out in 2000 late 2000s, maybe. Old. Or, yeah. yeah. And so some of the advice has held up and some of the advice is not held up. But I thought, yeah, okay, well, let's have, a, let's have a book. I'll just call it Beyond the Basic Stuff with Python, just to carry on that stuff uh, in the title uh, wording. But yeah, so it goes into some advanced Python concepts about the Python language and some of the, the gotchas and uh, more esoteric features. But I also cover general programming uh, topics like object-oriented programming and, and creating classes. And I try to explain classes as why do you actually need this? And, and classes are a great way to organize your code, especially as you're uh, programs become larger and larger. I feel like the mistake of learning Java as your first uh, programming language is that you think, oh, we need classes because that's just how you write programs. You fit exactly. everything into a class and and then you well, start cool. creating these, yeah, you start creating these in like massive inheritance hierarchies of, you know, A subclasses, B subclasses, C, and and pretty soon your, pro, your, soft, your source code is really complicated and yeah. hard to read. But uh, and then you realize like, oh yeah, it just prints hello world to the screen. Um, 
<laughs> I think it's, you know, it, it's that problem, like, once again, curse of knowledge. And sorry to interrupt again. Go on. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, for sure. And I've, I've seen a lot of software developers sort of fall into that trap. They just have, you know, the engineer brain yeah, uh, exactly. where it's yeah. like, oh, well, it makes sense to me. And you put all these complicated pieces get to, together. And then you, you have to remember that computers exist to make human lives easier and yeah. not the other way around. But yeah, so beyond the basic stuff with Python also goes into some, what I call like software engineering best practices. Like how should you write your, your functions? What kind of names should you give your variables? I've noticed that I think uh, data is pretty much the worst variable name that you can, <laughs> that you can uh, <laughs> name your variables. It's uh yeah. It, though, what does this variable contain? It contains data. Um, <laughs> it's, I say like, you know, it's sort of like if you were moving uh, houses and you just labeled all of your moving boxes as stuff, um, yep. which is sort of late on, later on to that process. Uh, so like, oh, here's bedroom things, here's kitchen appliances. And then after a while, I've just give up. And I'm like, stuff, 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 stuff. Like with moving, if you keep giving sloppy names to your variables, that's going to bite you later on when you actually yep. have to like check your source code and say, hey, what does any of this actually do? Um, and, and a lot of this stuff isn't, uh, this isn't a, a thing that you'll learn in these hello world tutorials where you're yeah. learning the syntax of a programming language. And it's, I tried to take all of this random information that I had learned over a couple decades and actually just put it into one book where it's like, okay, you can just sit down and read this. There's still plenty more that you'll learn uh, just uh, from day to day experience. But this will just give you that one leg up. Uh, I, I forget the the other chapters in that book, but it's it's just sort of like the best practices for writing your code the way that professional uh, software developers will write their code. But I love what you've done because the first book is like give you a taste of what's possible, and like whet that appetite. Like I wanted, I want to learn to code, and you have these quick wins. You can do a bunch of stuff without <laughs> stuff. I shouldn't say that. Sorry. Uh, you can do a bunch of things without, um, you know, having to learn all the software like uh, programming, computer science stuff. And then once you get the foundation right, then you get okay. Now that you've seen what's possible, now I'm going to teach you how to, you know, scale this up. And I think that's a fantastic way to do it. Yeah, that's a that's another thing that I write about in Beyond the Basic stuff with Python. Is I have a chapter on environment setup which yeah. is sort of just the general term for how do you get Python installed on your computer? Because yeah. this is always a surprisingly complicated yeah. thing yeah. because some people have Windows, some people have Mac, some people, uh, they're using their company laptop and they don't have the permissions to install software. Oh, but now their, their path environment variable isn't set up. Exactly. Or, so like yeah. when they type Python, they're actually running the a different version of Python because they have multiple versions of Python installed. And so I, I go a little bit into just using the command line and some basic concepts like that. But a lot of times when I'm, whenever I do a workshop of, hey, learn to code in Python, even if you have no experience, I often find I have to do a pre-workshop workshop, workshop yeah. just to make yeah. sure everybody has Python installed on their computer and everybody can just get hello world to appear on the screen. And then we can move on uh, to to actually learning how to program. You know, again, once when you've had decades of experience, all of this stuff is just like, oh yeah, you have to do this. And if it gives you this error message, it actually means that you have to change these configuration settings and things like that. We know all of this just because we have experience, but it is uh, just a complete blocker for anybody else who uh, does not have that experience and just sees this. And then just sort of says like, well, I have no idea what to do um, because they don't realize that professional software engineers are just Googling these questions. Anyway, exactly. we don't know what these exactly. error messages mean either. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it, it's it's intimidating when you when you when you start out. It looks like magic. I think you've said, and in, 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 I've heard you say, but it's not it's not like that, is it? It's just once the once you realize what's actually going on, it's just a bunch of humans trying to make things work, and we all make mistakes. Uh, that's uh, another common anxiety I see with people learning to program is they say like, well, I've been doing this for three months, but I still have to Google every single day. Like, <laughs> when will I be able to stop Googling things all the time? It's like <laughs> when you die. Uh, yeah, it's like I might want to sit down for this. Um, <laughs> programming seems magical, especially uh, computer security and, and hacking topics. Yeah, that also seems uh, it's. 
there's there's plenty of jokes about how hacking is portrayed in movies and TV shows and exactly. then how hacking is portrayed in real life where it's just sort of like quietly typing at something and then pressing enter and then like, no, oh, that didn't work. Oh, wait, now it did work. OK, we're in. I think the one uh, common thing between movie hacking and real life hacking is uh, personally, I love saying I'm in. <laughs> whenever I, I finally are, am able to accomplish something. It's really interesting, your story. Sorry to, to interrupt again. Oh, it's yeah, yeah. great to hear that you you know, you know were interested in hacking. Um, and, and I think hacking is just like Mr. Robot more recently, you know, the, the, the series is, right. is a great example of how, you know, people can see what it can do, but then you've got to make a decision. And the decision hopefully is be on the good side, not on the bad side of, of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Mr. Robot did... Uh, you know, there are still parts of that show that are they're sensationalized, uh, but they tried course, to yeah. bring a much more grounded portrayal of yeah. of what uh, a lot of computer hacking is. And so, anyway, uh, cracking codes with uh, Python it it doesn't cover any uh, actual encryption algorithms that are in use today. Um, even the R RSA cipher or RSA algorithm I, I cover at the end of the book it's sort of what's known as textbook RSA. Uh, which, you know, technically, yes, it is encrypting, but actual encryption programs, there's so many other factors that you have to think about and, and protect against that, it, you know, you shouldn't actually use the program in this book to, to do that. But it does give you, uh, the book does give you a good idea of why a lot of encryption algorithms can fail, uh, because yeah. you can do frequency analysis, uh, because uh, you can... Uh, do count, uh, counting up sort of the spacing in between uh, identical symbols in the ciphertext and all of these other things about why, you know, it's a, what some clever person in the 1600s came up with to encrypt their text uh, is not going to work today here in no. 2022 when we're all basically carrying supercomputers in our pockets. But I love it. I mean, it, it's a, it's, a, it's again, you've given a, someone who's interested in that stuff a reason to learn Python. And the net result of that is they've learned how algorithms work. They've learned about ciphers. They've learned about decryption. And I love the, that you don't just show them how to encrypt. You show how to decrypt and how to recognize patterns and all this kind of stuff. Um, so you walk away with a lot of knowledge if you're interested in that kind of thing, just like you know, automating uh, like a web browser. You, you, it's all this. You're giving people a reason to learn. And then they're picking up all this Python knowledge along the way. It's it's a fantastic way to do it. Yeah, I, I went to DEF CON for the first time ever uh, a few years ago. And uh, this is sort of uh, living out the teenage dream that I had because I like, <laughs> did great. not have enough money to fly out to Las Vegas uh, when I was a kid. But I was really struck by how, how so many security professionals actually didn't know how to code. Um, yeah. They're just used to you know, all these, knowing all these network concepts and using all of these tools uh, for their job, but uh, actual programming wasn't necessarily something that they knew. And so it, it was really amazing because I thought like, well, you know, you can just write all these tiny scripts to automate different tools or, or glue them together with, with some Python scripts. And it's a really powerful skill to have. Um, I agree. Uh, yeah. No matter what what job in tech that, you, that you're that you doing. You mean, I, I'm, I'm with you on that because it's... Um... I th you've mentioned it before. It, you're not becoming like a, like a Facebook developer that's going to build an app like Facebook with millions and millions of users. You, that that could be that's like a software developer path. But if you're into ethical hacking, or you're into network automation, like if you're a network engineer, or you're into something else, stuff like this can just save you so much time and it gives you so much power. Once you once you start coding, you can't go back. Yeah, exactly. It's. Oh, I, I use the the metaphor of it's like learning how to drive a, yeah. a car. Y yeah. You know, you're not necessarily going to become a race car driver or a taxi cab driver, yeah. but it is even if you don't own a car, it's a useful skill to have in your back exactly. pocket and you'll be able to go much further than without having that skill. Al, we've been going for a long time. Do you want to say anything or have you got anything to share before we wrap this up? I, I just really want to point out how many opportunities and and privileges that I've had in my life that have gotten me to this point and how important it is that we do take active steps to include other people in, in our communities. Um, the Python community especially is great. I, I go to PyCon as often as I can. They they just started up again this year, uh, but, and I plan on going to PyCon next year as well. But uh, people in the Python community, you know, it's 
it's not just that the Python programming language has technical merits, but it's the people behind the language as well who yeah. are taking the time to make sure that it's you know easy to learn for for others, that it's accessible to others, that you don't just have to be like the stereotypical standard software nerd to to be a part of it. And it's really important because programming is amazing, and it's something that we should be making available to as many people as possible. And it's it's not enough to just say like well, we don't have a rule that excludes certain people or something because exclusion happens automatically anyway. Uh, it's, it, you know, people will uh, look at a, a group and say like, well, I'm not sure, is this for me or is this not? And and they'll just sort of pre-select themselves out of it. And I feel yeah. like that is a definite loss and that we should take active steps to, to prevent that. I mean, it's fantastic. Anna, you know what, I, again, I really want to thank you for making your books freely available. Um, I come from South Africa originally and it's it, it, there's a lot of poverty out there in in places like South Africa, and it's amazing how you making education freely available. And I I'm a firm believer, you know, if you if you can educate someone, they can change their lives, but they also the lives of their family and their and the the gen generations thereafter. So thanks so much for you know making the books available for free um, and not putting it behind a paywall. Oh, thank you very much for having me on this on this show. Oh, thanks. All the very best. Oh, thank you so much.